Welcome to Matters Financial, the geopolitical from the frontier. I hope the week's going well. We've had a bit of rain and it's rather fresh now, so it's very pleasant. Um, I like this photograph from Africa Lives. The beautiful sky over Mount Longanot. Once walked around the perimeter, it's an old um, and ancient volcano. I like this image, Les Coudères sont en tête des métiers les plus recherchés. And the coders are very sought after in France right now. Um, my piece over the weekend was Here Comes President Trump. I hope you get to get a chance to read it. But I was making a number of points, and one of them was the traditional media has lost its position of control. Um, higher interest rates are going to propel a big dollar rally from here on in, and it's only just getting going. And uh, I'll leave you with one final thought, that um, the Fed hike in December looks like a done deal. Have a look at the probability ratio. Carney urges caution as banks threaten to relocate over Brexit. He really has been the same voice um, throughout. Michiko Kakutani tweeted, Blue Supermoon. And indeed, it's been a wonderful moon, I must admit. Um, I was listening to the George Michael in Easier Affair last night, and I thought to myself, I'd like to have a party and have him sing it here in Nairobi. The most important lesson is also the most ironic, Ken Casey. Truth Slinger is a tremendous photographer. Elephants on a minimal elevation of all animals, these give me the most joy. Me too as well. I like this photograph by Pravda of the Jaguar. I have one and it's rather fun, I must admit. BBC World Service lawyers forbid couple from bad-mouthing each other in front of their parent. You remember the story of my parent called Basil. Um, I was very fond of Basil and one year I came back and I think mum had been in England and they decided they couldn't look after Basil and they gave him away. And more than 20 or 25 years later, I turn up at a friend's house, it's early hours in the morning, and he says to me, Ali Khan, I've got your parrot. And I couldn't believe it. And I went in there and he said, it was such a hostile parrot. And I stuck my finger in, and Basil recognized me immediately. And I was allowed to tickle Basil's, the top of Basil's head. And they all watched in amazement. The supermoon, I took a photograph of it myself, it reminds me of Konya, Turkey, where we went to visit, um, and the moon was as intoxicated then as it's been for the last two nights. Trump is a big fan of NATO, says NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg. That's interesting. And listen to this, American allies were blindly dialing into Trump Tower to try to reach the soon-to-be leader of the free world. President-elect Donald J. Trump's transition was in disarray on Tuesday, marked by firings, infighting, revelations that American allies were blindly dialing into Trump Tower to try to reach the soon-to-be leader of the free world. One week after Mr. Trump scored an upset victory that took him by surprise, his team was improvising the most basic traditions of assuming power. That included working without official State Department briefing materials in his first conversations with foreign leaders. Two officials had been handling national security for the transition, former Representative Mike Rogers of Michigan and Matthew Friedman, a lobbyist who consults with corporations and foreign governments, were fired. Both were part of what officials described as a purge orchestrated by Jared Kushner, Mr. Trump's son-in-law and close advisor. The dismissals followed the abrupt firing on Friday of Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey, who was replaced as chief of the transition by Vice President-elect Mike Pence. Mr. Kushner, transition official, said, was systematically dismissing people like Mr. Rogers, who had ties with Mr. Christie. As a federal prosecutor, Mr. Christie had sent Mr. Kushner's father to jail. Steve Bannon, who's also got a big advisory position, was apparently charged with domestic violence. He choked his wife. Police took pictures. 
in Syria, according to Sputnik, seven newly deployed S-300s and S-400s already based in Syria cover the Med all the way to Cyprus. Aleppo airstrikes restart as Russia announces major Syria offensive, and that was within hours of a conversation between President Putin and President-elect Trump. Pro-Assad forces have intensified attacks on Syrian rebels, launching a fierce aerial bombardment of besieged eastern Aleppo, and missile strikes from a Russian aircraft carrier stationed off the coast the day after Donald Trump and Putin spoke on the phone. U.S. President-elect and Russian President discussed regulating the conflict in Syria and the need to combat international terrorism and extremism, Putin's office said in a statement. The rebels, in my opinion, are now dead-enders. I wrote about this over the weekend when I said, putting a stop-loss into play with the Syrian rebels who are a bunch of ne'er-do-wells and paid mercenaries. Reaching out to Putin indicate a trend of change way the U.S. engages with the rest of the world and strikes me as an entirely sensible mid-course correction. As Trump has indicated, China is the main adversary and it's difficult to understand why the U.S. was seeking to send Vladimir into Xi Jinping's ready embrace. To triangulate China, the U.S. needs Russia on its side and not on China's. This was an interesting piece in the New York Times where even nightmares are classified. Psychiatric, psychiatric care at Guant Guantanamo. Over and over the psychiatrists recalled, men would ask, why am I here? What's my future? Questions the doctors could not answer. Sometimes they said their work felt futile. Russian Admiral Grigorovich frigate targets terrorists in Syria with missiles. Have a look at this photograph. Duterte's weakness is really he's a tough guy. Greco Belgica, Filipino politician, and an ally of Duterte said, We do not talk down to a tough guy. You'll snap. It's the age of the tough guys. The German Foreign Office, Foreign Minister Steinmeier, on his visit to Turkey, had difficult talks with Turkey's leadership. Differences of opinion can't be bridged by one visit alone, another strong man in Erdogan. Again. International markets, what a difference a week makes. S&P future currently trading 7.4% above the post-election low. U.S. stocks have gained a trillion dollars in market cap. Uh, David Inglis asks, does the Dow Jones top 19,000 this week for the first time in forever? Let's go to the currency markets, Euro 107.52, dollar index above 100, 100.03, Japanese yen 109.10, Swiss yen above parity, pound 124.82, Aussie um, 0.7543, Indian rupee 67.725, South Korean 111.6750, the real 344.29, the Egyptian pound has firmed up after a sell-off that took it over 17. It's now at 15.452, and the rand is firmed a little, 14.1568. I'll put up a one-year chart of the dollar index. My target of 100 from earlier in the year has been hit. I'm looking for 110. Euro dollar, take a look at this chart from Aurelia, 107.52. Um, she seems to think that it's going to bounce off the bottom of the range. Dollar yen has broken above 109 for the first time since June 3rd. And incredibly, UK inflation fell in October, uh, annual rate down to 0.9% versus 1%. It was expected to be 1.1%. A monthly rate 0.1% versus 0.2%, but they expected 0.3%. Certainly, I was expecting a sharp spike, but it is predictable and predictable still. Gold, just around the 1230 level, that could not push through 1300 resistance, and we're down here. Uh, OPEC says they have all hands on deck um, as deadline to complete oil deal looms. Saudi Arabia's warning Trump on blocking oil imports. Saudi Arabia's warned Donald Trump that the incoming US president will risk the health of his country's economy 
if he acts on his election promises to block oil imports. In a sign of the difficulties Mr. Trump faces over his campaign pledges to create complete American energy independence from our foes and the oil cartels, Saudi Arabia's energy minister pointedly reminded the president-elect that the U.S. benefits more than anybody else from global free trade. Energy is the lifeblood of the global economy, so they're concerned. There was a big ratchet higher in crude oil prices yesterday. We're trading higher again. We're above $46.50 in New York. Multinational firms dumping Venezuela operations and fire sales, says Reuters selling their operations at hefty discounts or even giving them away as they seek to escape the OPEC nation's soaring inflation and chronic supply shortages. Put up a photograph of Nicolas Maduro and I've been speaking about this for a while. It's a sort of extraordinary laboratory experiment situation. Mexican wall formations, uh, Aurelia's uh, tummy cheek chart for the dollar Mexico. CCTV Africa, coming on Africa Live, presidents from Africa join other world leaders in Marrakesh for a high-level climate change discussion. African Eurobond yields have risen sharply since Trump's victory. Angola's a near 12%, Nigeria's 8.1%, and the highest since March, and Kenya's in there as well. Congo leader warns against foreign interference and crisis. The Congolese have shown that they can responsibly resolve their differences. Kabila tell lawmakers to applaud and fill the room. I warn against and denounce all interference in Congolese affairs. Our country has a right to have its sovereignty respected and will never give that up. He blamed the violence squarely on his opponents. No political agenda will justify violence, still less the loss of human life, he said. Trying to take power by the blood the Congolese is, more, is morally condemnable. In some months, the electoral register will be ready and the election will be held, he said, without giving a date. He does not appear to be a president who is in a hurry to depart. Congo's president says he'll hold power until 2018. The accord signed in October between the ruling party and a small number of opposition groups is the only way forward, he said. I cannot allow the DRC to be taken hostage by a fringe of the political class. The cabinet, of course, resigned as part of that deal for Kabila to stay. And then there's the story that Congo awarded payments from a Glencore mine to Kabila's friend. State-owned copper producers signed over millions of dollars in future payments to an offshore company owned by billionaire Dan Gertler, according to Global Witness. The contract we have seen provides no reason for Gekameen giving away these royalties. And I concluded by saying what good friends they are. Um, the Daily Maverick has a story, Joseph Kabila's friend with benefits. In June 2016, I wrote that he outwitted Moishi Katumbi by removing him from the street in the Congo entirely, and I said at that time it might well prove a cleverly administered technical knockout. Uh, but we're still to see. And then in May 2015, I was saying you know, there is a threshold beyond which the incumbent cannot go, particularly one like Kabila, whose popularity is less than 10%. And I said, where that threshold lies will be discovered in the throes of the event. As we look around the world today, we can see a battle for the street. From the streets of Bujumbura to the streets of Baltimore. In November last year, I wrote about Wangadugu's signal to Sub-Saharan Africa and concluded that we need to ask ourselves how many people can an incumbent shoot stone cold dead in such a situation? 100, 1,000, 10,000. This is another point, there is a threshold beyond which the incumbent cannot go. Where that threshold lies will be discovered in the throes of the event. And on that basis I was quoting Virilio, the revolutionary contingent attains its ideal form, not in the place of production, but in the street, where for a moment it stops being a cog in the technical machine, and itself becomes a motor, a machine of attack, 
becomes, in other words, a producer of speed. South Africa's Zuma asks the state prosecutor to give reasons why he should not be suspended. And I concluded by saying the minions are having to pay a price for getting entangled in the Zuma web. Crumbling edifice, how long can the Zuma presidency hold? asks the Daily Maverick. Presidency needs a war room just to keep track of the daily scandals, exposés, and controversies besieging President Jacob Zuma, members of his cabinet and government institutions. On one day, the news cycle was consumed with another set of charges being laid out against the President, the Minister of State Security fending off revelations about his involvement in a rhino horn trafficking syndicate. The disclosure of an irate exchange between the National Director of Public Prosecutions and the head of the Hawks over Pravin Gordon's prosecution, saying, you know, how long can this go on? South African all shares down 2.49% of the year. Dollar versus Rand 14.155, firmed a little bit of late. Nigerian all share down 9.72%. This year, Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index down 16.27% this year. The owner of the Uri Vesaria Imperial kidnapped at gunpoint in Summer Shield, Mozambique. These abductions have started up again. Kenya, I wrote a piece about the CBK governor saying he's building a robust banking sector. It is sometimes easy to forget that the phenomenon of the real time of Twitter and social media is a very recent one. The velocity of change in this regard has been mentioned by Paul Barilio, who said speed now illuminates reality, whereas light once gave objects of the world that shape. The new digital universe has engulfed the world, and Kenya is no exception. I described President-elect Trump as a 21st century linguistic warfare specialist, and he used linguistic warfare to devastating effect. The names he gave his opponents, Crooked Hillary, Lying Ted, Little Marco, Low Energy Jeb, were devastating. Traditional media has been disrupted, and President-elect Trump and Brexit confirmed that disruption and how insurgents can broadcast live and direct and over the top. Comic turned politician Pepe Grillo, co founder of Five Star, said this is the deflagration of an epoch. It's the apocalypse of this information system, of the TVs, of the big newspapers, of the intellectuals, of the journalists. I have watched central bankers for eternity. I ran interest rate trading desks, and the central banker tends to be the linchpin when it comes to interest rates. Central bank assists the apex of the banking system and so much hinges on his or her skill. The central banker can be described as someone holding a Fabergé egg as all and sundry try and jostle and make him spill the egg. Today a central bank has to navigate through an entirely different environment. An environment where personal abuse is considered par for the course in this new world of Trump. Dr. Jirogi, who is the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, is a Roman Catholic and a numerary member of Opus Dei. Dr. Jirogi's credentials are impeccable, and the way he conducts his personal life should surely be a lone star for the public service here in Kenya and the African continent. Therefore, the first point to note is that launching a real time linguistic warfare campaign on the governor and the Central Bank at this juncture is inaccurate, unfair and in fact inimical to the national interest. The governor is determined to bring the banking sector under control. What is clear is that the panoply of state institutions have been slow to engage at the same speed. The banking sector remains fluid and multi-sided and confidence is frayed and understandably, but as Dr. Jirogi said during the Chase Bank saga, none of us have a right to shout fire in a crowded theatre this is what happened. We had some individuals who did shout fire, and to me that was very reckless because no bank can sustain the pressure of everyone trying to withdraw their money at once. As we scan the banking horizon, we can safely say that paper digital trails are impossible to expunge. 
The forensics will have the final word. We have now entered a managed process of consolidation. We are surely entering a new era. Condoleezza Rice spoke of the birth pangs of a new Middle East. Post the interest rate bill and the Dubai, Imperial and Chase Bank developments, we are also watching the birth pangs of a new banking sector here in Kenya. It is impossible for me to imagine a more qualified surgeon than Dr. Jirogi to manage this. This is a fact. Therefore, let's not lose sight of the main goal, which is a robust banking sector, optimized to propel Kenya Inc. into the future. Second reported first half profit after tax accelerated 7.87%, investment and other income up 1.26%, Finance costs down 24.99%, share of associate profits almost doubled. Earnings per share 257 versus 256. Cash and cash equivalents 5.384 billion, half what they were previously. Um, half one borrowings 19.327 billion. They say the net asset value is 61.12, it's trading at 41 shillings. Called it a challenging micro environment, recorded a 5% growth in the book value of shareholder funds, uh, saying that the consolidation of long haul publishers, improved profitability of the group's portfolio companies, lower finance costs as a result of reduced forex losses, all combined to improve the profit. And what was interesting is that last time round they booked an extraordinary gain of 1.7 billion shillings, which they weren't repeating, so therefore. When you strip that out, it was a very, very strong performance. Have a look at their portfolio. They tweeted this. Um, so it was a strong performance, in my view. Nairobi all share down 4.54% this year. NSC20 down 19.28%. And let me leave you with a photograph of silhouettes at sunset in Titan. Once again, thank you for stopping by.